Hello and welcome back. OK, so today's video is called Spring Cleaning because I've got a few small jobs that I want to tidy away on the build while I'm still finishing off the peripherals and before I start with some big coding exercises. So let's have a look at some of these. OK, so here's the CPU as it currently stands. You've got the core CPU components. We've got the UART sound system and the VGA over here. And most of these PCBs are pretty much final. Now the backplane components, I want to replace those with a, a backplane that merges everything together once we've actually finished it all. But some of these modules do have bodge wires on still, most importantly the clock down here. Now I know some people are very keen on seeing me uh, finish this off because then I'll uh, release the schematic and uh, some people want to take a look at that. So when we fitted these bodges, I did update the schematic and order a fresh new PCB. So let's take a look at that. OK, so this one has served me quite well, but I think we need to get rid of the bodges. I actually ordered this pretty soon after uh, making these tweaks, but it's just been sat in the, uh, the pile for a while. I've soldered one of these before, so I'm going to cut this right down but I will upload a more complete video of the soldering and assembly if you're interested. Click the link. Right, that looks to be correct behavior. Right, so should have a clock output there and next to it on both sides we should have a ground line. Okay, so it's a nice clean clock signal. Okay, trace mode, that's 15.5 hertz. Let's see if we've got decent adjustment range on it. That's all the way up to 125, that looks pretty good. Tuning that to about 100. Right, so with the divisor set to zero, we've got 12 and a half megahertz. And that's the 1.57 we've been running at in the last couple of tests. That's a simple test, pretty straightforward. Um, I think it's worth just dropping it back into the CPU build and see if it performs correctly. Okay, so we've got the new PCB here. Now one thing I did take note of is if I try and put the crystal onto the pin headers here, they didn't sit very well, so I rotated these around 90 degrees to match the, the previous one. I should investigate sockets for those. Okay, let's fire it up. Started off in brake mode, the same as the other one does. Trace mode looks functioning. As does the step. Okay, I mean, that feels pretty good. So the monitor program has loaded fine. Looks pretty promising. Okay, well, I don't want to get a VJ monitor out right now. So let's try something else. Very proud of this game. Something I will have to do is port this to the VGA system once I've got that uh, finished off. And obviously we could get some sound into it now. I think that proves that our clock works fine. The next bodge that I'd I want to look at is up in the ALU result. Now that's the one remaining physical bodge in the main CPU. But before we do that, I've got something else to look at. Okay, now I've written quite a lot of code for this CPU now. And I have kind of clocked that I've got a problem somewhere. Now these conditional jumps, I implemented them all in one go and I've used some of them and they've worked fine, but I've used a couple of them and they didn't quite behave the way I expected. Now, because there's quite a wide variety of these, I've kind of been under a time pressure to finish a video or something. And so I've kind of moved on, but 
I don't like being in a situation where I don't entirely trust some of these instructions. And whilst the vast majority of instructions in the system I've tested quite thoroughly, these ones, it's only a subset I've tested. Okay, so these single flag ones I'm very confident in. I've used those lots. These are arithmetic comparison operations. These are the ones where I've hit problems. Now I copied these out of one of the x86 instruction sets. So some of these abbreviations are not obvious to people, but we've got uh, jump if below, which you see has exactly the same combination as jump if not above or equal, because they effectively mean the same thing. But the x86 assembly language, it uses both of these because there's some circumstances in which um, the, the different bits of terminology just, just flow better when you're reading the code. I've got an idea on what the problem is here. I'm a little bit more worried I've got a problem down here. And you can probably tell that what I'm interested in doing is making sure I don't have a flaw in the ALU result PCB before I solder up a new one. So let's test all of these, work out if we really do have a problem, see if we can fix it. I'm hoping that any problem we've got here is just a problem in the ROM data or in the software implementation. Let's remind ourselves what these are. Okay, so I'm annotating each of these with the C style operator. Okay, I did put these all in the same logical order. Okay, so we've got four of each. So that's a total of eight flag combinations we need to test. I'm gonna write some code to do that. Okay, so here's what I've come up with. Now I've built a basic data table here with the conditional jumps in and some strings that identify them. So when I call this test function eight times, now this could be done a lot neater and clearer, but uh, this was rapid test code. And what the test function does is it just does two loops outputting either a hash or a dot, depending on the results of the comparison here. But then what I do is I read in the check that is actually enabled in the table and self-modify this little piece of code. So I actually do this eight times with eight different conditional jumps in. Let's run this and see if it works. Okay, these are the kind of results I would expect to get, apart from on this one, where I can see it's wrong on the outset. Now, because I'm processing integers on the horizontal and vertical axis, at the midpoint, they change sign. So I would expect in a comparison, these corners to be solid one way or the other. And that's not the case down here. I think something's not working. Okay, here's what I've done. I wrote some C++ code, which re-implemented these loops and the conditional checks and output the data which I am expecting, but I know to be correct. A lot of this looks very similar, but if we come down to the signed greater, we can see that we do have this corner to corner difference sections that we'd expect. That confirms what we had guessed, but we know our assembly language version is producing incorrect results. But um, I think we need to be a bit more exacting than this. So what I'm gonna do is pasting the output from the assembly language code. And then I'm gonna get the development software to diff it. Okay, chop the top line off. But this, this looks basically to be the opposite but that is a match for what we've got down here. Yeah, so less is a match for what we generate for the great or equal test. And greater or equal matches less than or equal. This actually makes logical sense. The jump if less than, or we say below, 
that should be if the carry flag is not set. And great or equal is the opposite of that. Let's, um, let's double check that. Okay, so let's fix those first two. Okay, these are not quite as simple as just swapping them. The comparison is the opposite in both cases of what it should be. But the equal component, so that's the check on the zero flag, is correct. Yeah, so we determined that, that one was wrong, and that makes sense. But then below or equal should be not carry or the zero flag and then the reverse of that is with the carry flag and JA needs to be inverted okay so pipe 1B needs to be updated now that makes logical sense because that's where the transfer bus assert and load operations are controlled from Okay, oh, that's excellent. So all of the unsigned operations are correct now, and now it's just this one. So jump if greater doesn't work, but jump if not greater does. That makes me pretty sure it's just software, because we could always just do exactly what the code is there and invert the result. Let's go look at the implementation. Okay, so I see it. What I've implemented in the code there is if not zero and not sign. We haven't done the comparison. So what we actually want is that. So the sign bit to equal the overflow bit and not zero. That feels right now. All right, it's just one B that's changed again. See, that looks promising already. And my diff tools immediately come back and said it does not differ. We've got all of these behaving themselves exactly right now. Awesome. Okay, so that's actually quite a big weight off my mind. I was slightly concerned that I might have had a deeper issue with the ALU, but um, it's not a circuitry problem. I just, uh, I hadn't checked my implementation of those instructions properly. Do need to be a bit more thorough with that, but... Um, it's not a big problem in the in the long run. Okay, so now that gives me confidence to actually fix the bodge off this PCB. Now, once again, when we made the bodge wire, I did actually make the modification to the schematic. So um, yeah, let's uh, take a look at that PCB that I've had sat in my drawer for ages. Now, I don't like having two bodge PCBs, but it is actually quite rewarding to um, troubleshoot a problem and get it to work. So this PCB is actually served quite well. But in theory, here's the fixed version. So here's a slightly different blue to the solder mask. But let's solder this up and, uh, and give it a test. Once again, I've cut this down, but there is an uploaded longer version if you're interested. Right, I don't see any effective way of testing this without just plugging it into the CPU build and, uh, and running some mathematical operations through it. So uh, let's get the build back out and give it a test. Now, hopefully this is gonna work fine. Not able to test it outside of the CPU build, but um, 
Obviously, there's actually a very small number of changes here, so it's mostly just the integrity of the soldering. Slightly annoying that the solder mask is a slightly different colour here, but all in all, I'm glad to get rid of these uh, messy wires. Now, bodge wires like this tend to be kind of unreliable over time, particularly if I did them, so I'm going to be a bit more confident of the processor long term with, uh, with the tidied up connections. Okay, so let's fire that up getting as far as displaying the bootloader's uh, command prompt is a pretty good sign. Well, I think if you want to give the ALU a bit of a stress test, then um, there's no better choice than uh, generating prime numbers. I can see the last few of those are correct. No reason to suspect the whole lot's not. That's brilliant. Okay, so the bodge wire modifications, possibly um, not the biggest change, but um, I like getting rid of those, uh, those wires. And it also gives me confidence to release the schematics for these PCBs without worrying that I'm leading anyone astray. You just have to deal with whatever other mistakes I've made and not found yet. Now, I've got a lot of programming for this thing coming up. I've got a lot more circuitry coming for the VGA over here. I'm gonna create a PCB for this section of the audio circuit, get that finished off. And there's a couple of bits more PCB work to, uh, to fit into this bottom right-hand corner. Although exactly what I do here was dependent on how much room I had left over after the audio circuit. So I can start thinking seriously about that now. Okay, I'm very pleased with the progress today. Although I've got a gradually growing collection of um, bodged PCBs that uh, are going to come pretty close to um, a functioning CPU in their own right by the time I'm done. Now, a very important thing what I've done today is give myself confidence in a section of the instruction set that I was previously a bit unsure of. And that's actually really important because I'm moving into a phase for the core CPU now of writing an awful lot more code. Now, I've written a bunch of small demos, but um, we've kind of hit the point now where I need to write big bits of program to really prove out the fact that what we've got here is an interesting and performant pipeline CPU. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm especially looking forward to not mistrusting some of those conditional jump operations that I've been eyeing a little bit suspiciously. I did work out the source of the problem on the unsigned operations. Now, to shortcut implementing the flag combinations is I copied the flag settings from an x86 instruction set manual. And that was a bit of a mistake. If I'd just spent the extra half hour necessary to work them out myself, it would have all been fine. But the x86 works very slightly differently with its flags than a lot of other processors I've been doing assembly language programming on. And that is during a subtract operation, it treats the carry flag more like a borrow flag. And that's why for those four operations, the carry flag setting was the opposite of what we expected it to be. The signed operation mistake was just a programming error, um, but all sorted now. Hope you found this interesting. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you again soon. Goodbye.